chapter eight, exercise metabolism and bioenergetics. And without further ado, here we go into chapter eight. <clears throat> the human body needs a constant supply of energy to function properly and meet the demands of exercise. The energy molecule used in cellular work is called adenosine triphosphate, ATP, and it is made from food substrates consumed in the diet. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy can e neither be created nor destroyed, only converted from one form into another. That is a uh, really important fact to know. I'm sure if you've taken uh, AP bio or probably regular bio and uh, chemistry, that's when they really drill into your head. Again, I haven't heard anything about that specifically on NASM, but uh, the first law of thermodynamics, energy can neither be destroyed nor or, um, created only converted from one form into another. I know that's a very important point to nail down. The fuels used to create ATP are glucose and carbo <laughs> from carbohydrates, free fatty acids from fat, amino acids from protein, and ketone bodies. These fuels mostly obtained through diet. Carbohydrates in the diet are broken down into glucose, which can produce ATP quickly via the process of glycolysis. Um, Quick promise, I will never do a video on glycolysis, uh, glycolysis because um, that's complicated and I uh, had a test on that in high school and it gave me an aneurysm. Glucose is stored in the form of glycogen. The amount of glycogen that can be stored in the body is much less than the amount of fat that can be stored. Free fatty acids are the byproduct of the breakdown of stored consumed fats. They are oxidized exclusively via the aerobic pathway, which uses oxygen to create ATP. Amino acids are the byproduct of protein breakdown or digestion. Amino acids can be metabolized via oxidative phosph phosphorylation. That's my guess. We're gonna have Siri verify that. Phosphorylation. Phosphorylation, I think I aced that. Uh, can we get a re uh, playback? But this is not typical in healthy people because protein is usually reserved for muscle building rather than ATP production. Ketone bodies are produced by the liver during periods of low energy intake or low carbohydrate availability. They can be oxidized via the oxidative phosphorylation pathway to create ATP. Exercise is categorized by two factors, intensity and duration. The higher the, higher the intensity of the activity, the shorter the duration must be. To perform exercises, the body needs fuel, which comes from food that is broken down through a series of chemical reactions to provide energy, ATP, and heat. The ATPC pathways is, a, is the simplest and fastest way to generate ATP. This system can be only support short duration activities because the supply of PC is limited. Glycolysis is an aerobic process and generates ATP quickly, but not a tremendous amount. The end products of glycolysis are ATP and pyruvate, which can become lactate under anaerobic conditions. Oxidative phosphorylation is a process that uses ox oxygen to create ATP from the substrate molecules at a relatively slow rate. Oxidative phosphorylation can be used pyruvate, starting from glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, or ketone bodies as substrate molecules. This oxidative metabolism produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct which is then exhaled. The most important factors determining the type of energy used use during exercise used, I think that's a typo in the study guide, used during exercise are intensity and duration. The intensity and duration of an activity are inversely related, which means that as intensity goes up, duration must go down. Steady state exercise is defined as a situation in which a person engages in the same level of activity without increases or decreases of intensity for several minutes. Intermittent exercise is defined as a frequent change in the workout requirement intensity during activity. I don't know if I completely messed that up or not. Exercise increases metabolic rate and breathing rate increases in proportion with it. When breathing rate becomes too rapid to allow talking, the body has shifted, oxidizing almost exclusively carbohydrates to fuel the activity. Lower intensity activities use a higher percentage of fat as fuel, but generally do not burn a lot of calories unless performed for a very long time. Higher intensity activities have a higher percentage of energy coming from carbohydrates and usually burn more total calories in a given time. Daily food energy intake needs to be adequate to maintain a healthy body weight. If daily food intake is matched to energy needs, a person is said to be in energy balance. Calories 
are the basic unit of energy provided by food. And a total number of calories that a person burns in a day is called the um, total daily energy expenditure, TDEE. The resting metabolic rate, RMR, is the minimum number of calories needed at rest to keep a person alive and meet all functional needs of the body. The thermic effect of food, TEF, is the number of calories that are used to digest a meal. Non-exercise activity thermogenesis, NEAT, involves burning calories in the activity that are not structured exercises. Exercise activity thermogenesis, EAT, ironic, I don't know if it's ironic, coincidence, is the calories burned during the structured physical activity or purposeful exercise. Um, that is chapter eight, uh, kind of a boring one, um, mostly because uh, these are very complex topics and I don't feel like it really doesn't do justice to the complexity of the topics. You know, a lot of this stuff you should know as like a basic fitness, someone who's interested in fitness, uh, not only as a personal trainer, um, and a lot of it I actually got from watching uh, Jeff Nippert's channel. Uh, so RMR, uh, TEF, NEAT, EAT, and TDEE. Lastly, uh, I want to offer a disclaimer to anyone watching this and who has been watching this um, as I upload. Um, so this is the uh, NASM CPT uh, seventh edition. Um, I believe they're on the, the ninth edition currently. So this is out of date, um, full full transparency. This is uh, a few editions behind. Um, but so far, what we've reviewed and gone over from the chapters, a lot of the concepts are the same, especially with exercise metabolism, bioenergetics. That doesn't change that much. Like. I, I guarantee 90% of the concepts from this uh, from this older study guide, they they won't hurt you to know for the exam. So this is this series is still a good good thing to play in the background to you know kind of get these concepts into your head, uh, get these the terminology kind of drilled in, so you're used to hearing them. And for most of the the kind of difficult words uh, to remember in terms, I am making sure. I'm going to jinx it, but I'm making sure I'm saying as many of the words that I can correctly. So if anybody does listen to it and they're just kind of trying to, you know, get comfortable with the uh, terminology in this uh, in this book, the co concepts, the core um, lessons that you can learn from um, the study guide, I, I do believe still hold up. Um, I do want to give a disclaimer about me uh, sharing this uh, study guide. I, I do believe I received this from a um, advisors of NASM. I think I received this through an email um, or I got it from Show Fitness. Either way, this this is a, a completely free study guide. Um, I'm not uh, tampering with the paywall. The uh, seventh edition isn't sold anymore. Um, so this is all information that has been come and gone. Um, and I, uh, I got this completely free. You can find this online uh, by giving it up a search. It is kind of buried down. Um, but uh, that's it for the disclaimer. Um, please, if you uh, if you watch, if you got to the end of this video, please uh, continue watching. I would really appreciate it. Um, and um, yeah, that's it.